Okay. I've got a real treat for you next, as if we didn't have treats for you all day. Um, and a quick reminder, we will be pulling out the Pitch It winner uh, to, to uh, or announcing the Pitch It winner uh, just after this last content session. So um, in the last content session, stumbling blocks to stepping stones. Building the future of finance from vision to reality. So we have Caitlin Long from uh, formerly known as Avanti Bank, now Custodia, and Gilles Gade from Cross River Bank to be interviewed by Lucinda Shen from Axios. Please welcome them with me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Sheil and Caitlin. I know that you guys have had a lot of travel recently. Um, I wanted to start us off with something interesting. So I was asked to moderate this panel last week. I had no role in organizing this. This all came from Crossover. But I did find it interesting. Caitlin, you run a banking as a service company focused on a lot of crypto companies. And Sheil, you focus on companies. You're also in a banking service uh, space. In theory, you're competitors. And you don't really see that together on a panel, willingly, <laughs> at least, talking face to face. And so I'm curious, why put yourselves together on a panel together? So is that a question for me? That's a question for you. Um, I have no clue. I, I, I really, um, I think I'm a little crazy about that. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I don't think I could have picked somebody better, to be honest with you, to be on a panel with. Uh, when, when I met Caitlin the first time, we immediately saw eye to eye. That was, uh, yeah, we just hit it off, and we believe in the same thing. We believe in the same approach. We believe in innovation, growth, and responsible um, consumer protection, all in one. And that's what mattered. So if we are really sharing you know, the same vision where this industry is supposed to go, um, then why not you know, share those views in public? And um, so... Here we are. And I think uh, we also vehemently agreed that the banking infrastructure is the right regulatory structure for a lot of this, uh, from custody to stablecoin issuance, uh, that, that the protections in the bank infrastructure and regulatory structure matter a lot. And then I think ultimately, uh, we pretty much vehemently agreed on the concept of open banking and API-based banking and exposing APIs to your customers so they can write software and make their lives easier. And it's amazing how few banks actually do that. Absolutely. So you guys see it as bonding together as the little guys for now, for now, against the bigger banks. Well, we're a teeny, teeny, we're not even launched yet, so right. <laughs> Cross River is, is, is no, obviously no, we're, a we're tremendous same, success. We, we weren't, you know, not that long ago, we're the right. same place, by the way. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, humble beginnings are um, always a, um, a, good, a good source of, um, of inspiration. And uh, just uh, looking at you and the way you are evolving in this market is, uh, is actually inspiring for us to continue and push through. Um, and, um, and honestly, I think that the market is up for grab. I don't think there's anybody who is big today that is going to just do a lame grab and own this market uh, forever. On the contrary, I think um, the little folks are the ones who are daring to take some risks and particularly to engage the, regula uh, the, the regulators in a, uh, in a fair and honest discussion and trying to sort this out because it's very complicated. There's a lot of uncertainty and a lack of clarity and that's what we're trying to do. And I don't think a big bank can take that risk today. I think what's also interesting about the two of you, um, as I've seen you in past interviews, Caitlin, you philosophic, or at least you've been described as philosophically, you're, you do not want to do lending. That's not something that your bank, as young as it is, is has on its roadmap at all. Correct. Gilles, that is actually a pretty sizable part of your business. Mm -hmm. Right. And so how are you guys each going about it and thinking about it? Very start? different business models. Uh, our, our business is really more, uh, well, I guess if I step back, it, we are about building networks of networks, and instead of 
driving profitability per customer, which is, I think, how traditional banks, excluding Cross River, think about things, get, 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 spend a lot on customer acquisition and then um, expand the profitability per customer by cross-selling. That's a classic business model in traditional banking. And we think about things very differently. We want to drive transaction volume through, not transaction profitability per se, and ultimately it's about building networks of networks, and so Custodia's business model is entirely fee-based, but that fits very nicely with Cross River's business model as well. So uh, the, the interesting fact about Cross River is that there's little known fact about our infrastructure play and our, um, our underpinning technology that enables most of the fintech players to uh, focus on their growth and let us uh, focus on the transactional uh, component of, their, of uh, the, uh, the transaction lifecycle. Um, so we do have our own core processor, core engine, uh, that we're putting at the disposal of all our fintech partners. It's very agile, it's real time. Um, in addition to that, we do have a, a payment infrastructure um, a solution that enables most of the folks on the lending side to actually cross the divide and come on the payment side and vice versa. So what we do do is that today, true, there is a, a pre preeminence in revenue on the lending side through all our partners on the marketplace lending side. However, the, uh, the payment side and the BAS side and the infrastructure play is rapidly catching up. And, but um, ultimately, it's that core infrastructure that enables all these players to evolve. And whatever the revenue falls at this, this year or next year as a percentage of, between lending and payment, is, uh, to us, it's irrelevant. It's all FinTech, and we know where the market is headed. So whether you're a lender or a payment um, facilitator, we're going to be here uh, for you to enable you to grow in both directions. Right. So one theme that even with the five minutes into our conversation I've heard over and over again is the R word, regulation. <laughs> <laughs> Going back, this panel was called stumbling blocks, stepping stones. And so do you think regulation has been the most, the largest stumbling block in the growth of your respective companies? Well, in Custodia's case, yes, absolutely, <laughs> um, because uh, we are a, a Wyoming chartered special purpose depository institution that has applied for a Fed master account and applied to become a Fed member bank, and uh, the Fed is taking its sweet time. <laughs> what, what is the status of that currently? Uh, well, when we applied for the master account, the application said, and it's a one-page application, uh, said processing may take five to seven business days. We're 19 months into it and have not heard an answer. Uh, we do know, at the Fed did actually, we have made some progress. The Fed did, did determine we are a depository institution, which is an enormous distinction because trust companies and money transmitters are not legally depository institutions. And in order to be eligible to have a, an account at the Fed, uh, you do need to be a depository institution. The Federal Reserve Act says that, uh, that it's, you're either, uh, you're eligible for a, a Fed, what's called a Fed master account if you're an insured depository institution or a depository institution eligible to apply for insurance, we're in the latter category. And so once they determine we are a depository institution, it's now a question of when, not if because the Federal Reserve Act actually is very clear. It says the Fed shall make the following list of services available to all depository institutions on a non-discriminatory basis. So once they said we're a depository institution, shall make the services available to all depository institutions on a non-discriminatory basis is pretty clear. It just doesn't say when. Well, that's annoying, but on, a, on like a hiccup <laughs> yes. basis, right? Like in theory, then you should have what, what is holding it up? I wish I knew. Honestly, yeah. But look, I, I mean, it, it is fair to say the regulators are struggling with crypto. Uh, and and I, I'll say one of the interesting, I just had a discussion with, um, with Senator Sanders here in New York. One of the challenges that the regulators are having in New York, as well as everywhere, is that when the regulators get trained on what digital assets are, they tend to get picked off and join the digital asset industry. We've seen that happen in Wyoming. Commissioner Albert Forkner is probably in the audience. He left to go start a trust company for uh, custodying NFTs. So um, it, it's, it, you know, and we've seen it at the Fed as well. The, the, the regulators learn 
learn digital assets, get excited by it, and then leave. And that creates a, a problem uh, with retention. And it's a cyclical thing in the, in the regulatory world, for sure. We're at the part of the cycle where the pay is so much more alluring in the private sector than it is for, for, for public service. So that's also part, part of it. It's not just crypto per se, but crypto has definitely been a part of the challenge of somebody learns it, gets excited about it, they go down the rabbit hole and never come back out right. and then end up dedicating their career to it as opposed to staying in, in, in the regulatory wor world. Yeah. And so at a, at, a, at a higher level, I, I would say the difference between a stumbling block and a stepping stone is the way you use it. Um, and, um, and this is something that we're witnessing live with what's happening at Custodia which is a stumbling block at first, the regulatory stumbling block, lack of clarity, we don't know exactly which regulator ultimately is gonna regulate you, but then you're pushing through and you're turning this into an opportunity. And then that, that means blazing the trail, because <laughs> if that gets solved, imagine what that's gonna do for the rest of the country. Right. So this, this is critical to really understand that there isn't such a thing as a stumbling block in terms of, even on the regulatory side, Ultimately, things will fall through for those who dare to challenge the status quo. And that is really a big lesson that uh, we're learning with Caitlin's uh, company today. Well, and, and Cross River has done that again and again. So we're just the latest iteration, and that's, I think, why we're kindred spirits, because you blaze so many trails with servicing, with the bank as a service model long before we started. And that's exactly why you're on the panel with me today, because <laughs> you're paying a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and well, speaking of regulation, right, and there being opportunity, um, to some extent, the fact that there is such onerous regulation in the space, both in banking, but also crypto adding an extra layer of complication to all of this, it is kind of an opportunity because not everyone wants to deal with it. Um, so I wanted to think about what's next in terms of areas that are questionably regulated, maybe will be regulated in the future, more questions than answers spaces, right? So how are you thinking about something like DeFi's or DAOs? How do you bank a creature that, in theory, doesn't really have a head? Well, one of the challenges with DAOs is there isn't a control person. And if there's not a control person, then you don't know who the beneficial owner is, and they're not going to be able to get a bank account or a securities account because they can't pass know your customer requirements. And so the smart um, organizations have actually named a control person and then once you have a control person who actually has some governance responsibilities in the organization and they can be voted on through the DAO structure in order to do that then then they can actually get a bank account so there are DAOs with bank accounts it's just certainly not not the not the norm it's it, it's very much a function of the structure and whether they can pass KYC and you guys do have obviously you do do bank crypto companies I mean, are those even centralized? Well, if they have a head, in that case, are they even DAOs and DeFi's anymore? No. Yeah. <laughs> They're hybrids. No. They're hybrids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other interesting point is, you know, as we're talking about innovations as well, you are having, I'm hearing a lot of, we are excited to see more companies like us in the space. It will be good for this. We're very, very small. There's a lot of opportunity for us to have each of our individual niches. Um, Sheila, how are you thinking about as we're hearing more banking as a service companies. And from a reporter's perspective, I can't help but start feel a little skeptical if everyone is a banking as a service company or is an embedded services player. And so is there a limitation to the growth at this point? Is my, is my anxiety limitation warranted? limitation in the amount of clients that we're going to onboard or the amount of people, how big the market is going to be? Or? Yeah, how big the, the market is for new banking as a service entrance. Uh, well, it's all about, I mean, it's the big discussion about embedded finance. Um, everybody wants to become a bank today because at the end of the day, it's, a, it's really a commodity, number one, and it's a functionality. It's not necessarily an industry. Uh, and at least it's not perceived as such, particularly since the 2008 debacle. Because then all the big banks de-risked and in come the little players called Lending Club and Prosper and Avant and many others and Marlette, obviously, and, and, and from a little later on, and, and all these folks, they really filled a tremendous void in the marketplace. So when you have um, a, an institutional industry that has lasted 200 years, that has only one way of conducting their business, and suddenly they are shutting down to the, um, 
to the common folks and to the consumers, in comes innovators. So, and we're seeing this time and again in every single industry that got disrupted. So in this case, I truly believe that it's a little bit too late uh, for the banks to wake up and, and pivot uh, to cater to an industry that has already moved on. The consumer loves to shop on a firm, you know, either on Shopify, Amazon, take a loan right there, open an account, have crypto rewards. I mean, it's just an experience. It's totally different. And the same holds true for new banks, the ones that really are getting what the consumer's aspirations are. Um, the only thing that we need to worry about is number one, infrastructure. Let's make sure that all these embedded finance aspirers are gonna get the products and services that the consumers deserve. And number two, that is true consumer protection. That's where we come in. That's where companies like, like ours come into play. We need to, that is the first agenda item. When we, we white paper any product or service, particularly if they are new, before we launch, we need to focus on one thing. How are the consumers gonna be protected? So that is the nexus of everything that we need to focus on. Once we solve this, everything else falls into place. So I believe that there is still a lot of legs to the banking as a service industry. We're just at the beginning of it. The, the, there are still many merchants who have, still don't have a banking as a service solution. All these are gonna aspire one day or another. If they have a critical mass of consumers, they'll go in that direction. So what does this, let's take a step back, what does this look like? What does this market look like? And I won't even say 10 years because I feel like that's not enough. What, let's say 20 years. What does this space look like in 20 years? Do you, do you see yourself as, <laughs> as a giant on the, that's um, a $30 billion company out there that ha is banking a bunch of fintechs? You talking about us? Yeah, well, both of you guys. Where do you <laughs> each see yourself in this ecosystem? Um, I, I sure hope so. I mean, um, I, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about uh, divine providence, uh, being at the right place at the right time and catering to the right folks. And, and what, you know, you can't control the wind, but you certainly can control what, the direction of the sail. So if the regulatory winds are, you know, blowing in one direction, make sure you adjust the sail and vice versa. So. The, the bottom line is, uh, we are kind of letting the market play itself out. We just have to be a listening ear to our clients, to their consumers, and to the regulatory body. And all those three things are moving very rapidly, or slowly, but in big bulks that are very disruptive and complicated, and we saw it during PPP particularly. Um, so these are things that you need to compose with. We just need to learn how to be nimble, efficient, and adapt to a very rapidly changing environment, even on the regulatory side. Yeah. And sure, I, I think a lot of the US dollar on off ramps with digital assets will be banks. The, the money transmission and trust company structure doesn't work for a whole host of reasons. Uh, the brouhaha over Coinbase and the bankruptcy risk is just one example. Those were not structures that were designed for what they're being used for today. We will have better structures, but we will have bank structures. It, and, and those of us who are trying to become banks, it's definitely been a long process. It's been painful. Um, but uh, I, I lament because I look at, the, at what happened with Terra Luna last week and think, gosh, our application, our business model has been on the Fed's desk for two years to issue a digital dollar through a bank structure, and what if they had acted on that, and a lot of people wouldn't have been scammed by the Ponzi scheme if there had been a bank version of that out there. Um, and, and so I think we will get there, and uh, we will have real-time gross settlement payment infrastructure, I think, in the next five years. I, I do worry a lot about a, the, the community banks in particular that don't have the API-based systems that we've built. In our, in our companies because they won't be able to handle the fast settling payments that the, uh, that the market is going to demand. There's no reason why the debit and credit can't be settled simultaneously. And right now it's not. And the, the delays, the operational risks, the counterparty risks, the cost, the trapped working capital that that entails, all of those costs are going to be uh, abstracted away because technology will solve it. 
Awesome. Okay, so it sounds like mix of technology and also more, well, I shouldn't just say regulatory clarity, but also more regulatory nuance. So regulatory, yep. like ability to see uh, demand for more clarity from some of these crypto companies that maybe don't have as clear insight into, for example, what their balance sheets look like. And a real bifurcation in the market where people will, we, we, we got an unbelievable number of incoming inquiries. How fast can you get open so you can fix the bankruptcy problem when the Coinbase article was out uh, by large, uh, large customers of, of digital asset custody because the Wyoming structure does protect the, the, uh, the, the custody customer better than a traditional structure does. And uh, once folks realized that and, and realized that was important, they started calling. Yeah. There's been a lot of business in Wyoming, that's for sure. Yes, yeah, indeed. at least for crypto companies. Amazing. Um, oh, I be believe we are, I'm not entirely sure actually what the clock is telling us. The clock um, just added some time, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Do we still have, another? yeah, that's a great period. I guess we did a good job, so we got a bonus. We got I a know, bonus. thank you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> So what about the other R word, right? Um, it tends to, we're having higher interest rates now that always affects banks in a way that we uh, are really not coming to terms yet. At least I don't think the market has come to terms with it yet. We are uh, facing a point where consumers aren't quite entirely affected, but maybe they will in the future. Um, banks, the whole job is risk, risk management. How are you guys handling this current state in the market? Well, we're not like really sure exactly where everything is going, but the question about a recession is getting a lot louder. Um, so risk management? Risk management. So um, our approach to risk management is very data um, oriented and analysis. Mm -hmm. um, that means that we're trying to bring a lot of people to the fray and particularly community banks and credit unions by providing them a treasurer in the box, right? The treasurer as a service or CFO as a service. So if you provide them with the right analytical tools, the ability to calculate their allowances, the ability to calculate their capital adequacy if they put on a type of asset that they never put on before, I think the regulators will be receptive to that. Yeah. Well, and, and that's what we're trying to, uh, to bring to the fray. So if the, the better we are at our own risk management, the better we can actually make others good at risk management right. as well. Well, so what are you seeing? You know, you have a data-driven approach. What are you seeing in the data right now? What is it telling you? Are we orange, some mauve color? What, where are we in the market? Said it again, I'm sorry? Yeah, what, what, basically, what is, the, what, are your, what is your data telling you at this moment in terms of where we are in the market? Are we in a recession? Um, what does uh, Goldman Sachs say? <laughs> Uh, we're not that type of bank. Um, I'm not going to opine. Uh, what we do see is that there is definitely a, a contr contraction of credit. Um, the folks with good credit, it looks like they're going to fare far better, which traditionally in the recession is always the case. Um, there is definitely a rise in interest rates. And the signs are there. Now, the question is, are we in a recession? Possibly. The question is not if, whether we're in a recession or not. It's how long it is going to last. And uh, you know, how prepared are you from a capital adequacy standpoint and risk management standpoint as well? Um, you just have to be prepared for those eventualities. You know, these are all cyclical. We've been living this for 200 years as banks. Uh, we've got to get used to this. And it's not going to end there. It's, it's going to be like this for many decades to come. Yeah. Well, ending on that note, uh, thank you very much for coming here today and having our conversation. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening in. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me on stage.